I'm Rebecca Giblin. I'm a law professor at the University of Melbourne, Melbourne Law School, uh, where I'm also the director of the Intellectual Property Research Institute of Australia. I've been working for about 15 years now on research around creators' rights and also access to knowledge. And both of these are really, really dear to my heart because I grew up in a house without books and I was always starving for something to read. And these days my uh, to read pile is, is formidable. I don't see any way that I'm ever going to finish it. Uh, but I still remember that feeling of starving for things to read. And my whole career has been around um, working with authors and working with libraries um, and trying to figure out ways that we can better achieve copyright's core aims of getting creators paid, but also ensuring widespread access to knowledge and culture. When you ask me about the benefits of Open Glam, and I'm thinking particularly about the digitization of collections, um, there are, there's, there's so many benefits to this, but I think crucially are the ones that further access. Um, I've always haunted libraries, but I never went to a gallery or a museum when I was a kid. And as an adult, it took me a really long time to feel at home in those spaces, to feel like I belonged there. And that feeling of belonging, I think, is really fundamental to having transformational experiences from art. And as well as serving more knowledgeable audiences, open digital experiences in, in the glam sector can be a gateway to access, to enable others to experience that tra transformational power of art and culture, if we can harness it right. Um, the other, the other, I think the other benefit of, of Open Glam is that it, it has the potential to start interfering with the major platforms dominance in this space. Um, cultural institutions have a bit of a lock at the moment on physical um, experiences of art and culture, but that's left a gap for platforms like YouTube and Spotify and um, Amazon, iTunes, Facebook. Have I said them all? Google, did I get, did I get all of them? This, that's probably most of it. They are colonizing the online space here. Um, and that's contributing to big uh, declines in the value share that actually goes to creators. And there's big um, need for public alternatives to provide some competition, to keep them in check, to provide some alternatives for creators as well as access. So in terms of barriers to open glam, there are a lot. Um, I'll mention some of the key ones that come to mind. Um, what the, the elephant in the room, of course, is that we do have in many countries really outdated copyright laws that are not doing a particularly good job of serving either creator interests or access interests. And we need to think about ways that those can be recalibrated to better suit the reality that we inhabit now. Um, and that means, uh, one of the things that's really tricky here is that those outdated laws do tend to protect um, some you know, very powerful, well-funded interests who do a lot of lobbying against that kind of reform. Uh, but there's a lot of potential if we stop thinking about copyright or we stop allowing um, these lobbyists to, to, to tell us that copyright is a zero-sum game, we can think about ways of making the pie bigger. So one of the really interesting things that um, I've been working on and my team at the Authors Interest Project is through rights reversion. And that means, uh, you know, creators routinely have to sign their rights away in order to get access um, to, you know, you know, distribution and production of their works. Uh, but there's not necessarily a reason for those, those assignments to be the entire term of copyright or to cover all rights or all territories and so on. Reversion is about getting those rights returned to creators in appropriate circumstances, which might be after a particular period of time. It might be in the case of rights that have been assigned but haven't been exploited and things like that. So uh, there are ways to think about copyright differently and to make the pie bigger and, and to get around those outdated copyright laws in a way that better works for both creators and for uh, GLAM institutions. Um, I think as well that 
Another big problem is that there are concerns that opening up collections could hurt creators um, and artists. And that, again, it's you know, absolutely there are ways of doing it um, that you know, might not work and there are ways of doing it that might be harmful. But there are also ways, as I just sort of described, that we can think about this creatively and we can, um, we can create laws that are actually working better for everybody. So I think just the mere possibility that you could do it wrong shouldn't mean that we don't try to do it right. I've been told, like I suppose over the years, you know, when you ask me about things that have opened up my eyes and mind to open glam. Look, to me, look, it's always been there. You know, even when I was a teenager working on my first uh, job on an IT help desk, I was there reading books, Project Gutenberg, free digital texts on my computer uh, during the quiet times. And it looked to my bosses like I was actually doing some work. Um, open access has always just been so critically important. But I suppose one thing that really shocked me, that really shook me uh, was something I was told a number of years ago when we were all still working on getting the Marrakesh Treaty off the ground uh, to enable better access to books for the blind and visually impaired. And that was some statistics about the number of books available in neg neglected languages, particularly in countries like South Africa, uh, but even the Philippines where Tagalog is the main language. The, the, the number of books, um, and you know, sometimes in some languages we're talking about mere dozens a year. Uh, it's just such a, a paucity, such a poverty of books um, that are even published in some of these languages. That that's something that just, I suppose, redoubled my, my drive um, and um, my keenness to see you know, what kind of work we can do here to help. Because I talked at the beginning um, of this chat about having that hunger for something to read. And um, there's that, you know, I don't have that problem anymore, but most of the world's population still does. And we can do something about it. For those listening to this who are hesitating about opening up collections, look, COVID's done a huge amount of work in showing why we need open collections, but this is just the start. As more habitats are destroyed, more pandemics are gonna follow. And so will more and more climate-driven um, disruptions, fires, floods, tornadoes, that restrict physical movement. As glam institutions, you can't rely on your audiences continuing to be able to keep coming to you. And also, I say we can't afford to keep letting the big platforms colonize the space either, or else very soon the share that goes to artists and other creators is going to be so small that they just can't keep going. Uh, so my message is find the brilliant people who have the ideas and the vision um, about how to do things differently in a way that actually works, build new coalitions and be brave. <laughs>